Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining from today. Um, it's great to be with you. Uh, I'm Michael Collins. I'm vice president at JFF, and I'd like to welcome you to the It Started at Horizons web series, or welcome you back for those of you who may have joined us for the first two events. For those of you who might be new to JFF or Horizons, uh, JFF is a national nonprofit that works to transform our nation's education and workforce development systems so that it works for everyone, including people who are vulnerable in our economy. And Horizons is our signature conference where we create a big tent to bring a diverse audience from education, tech, nonprofits, CBOs, employers, policymakers, entrepreneurs, innovators, um, together in service of reimagining and transforming our education and workforce development systems to meet the needs of today's and tomorrow's economy and to prepare people for jobs for now and for the future of work. Today's event, Race and Education, Past, Present and Future, is focused on racial equity and we'll get in that in a moment. Um, it's the third episode of, it, of, of the series and it follows our inaugural event that featured the work of the California Community College System and the second event that featured innovators implementing next generation career navigation models. The recordings of both of the previous episodes are available for those of you who may not have been able to see them and they're both terrific and highly recommended. So for today, we're gonna to continue um, the conversation uh, with an innovator and leader in the field today. Um, we have with us John Simpkins, president of MDC. Uh, MDC is a national nonprofit based in Durham, North Carolina, that's been working to create racial equity and opportunity in the South for over 50 years. And we'll meet John in a second. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about him before I uh, invite him to, to join me on camera. So before joining MDC, taking the helm at MDC, John held multiple executive leadership roles at the state and national and international level. Most recently, he was vice president at the Aspen Global Leadership Network at the Aspen Institute, where he mobilized over 3,000 fellows around the world to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. John is a constitutional scholar and practicing attorney who served in the Obama administration as deputy general counsel for OMB and the general counsel for USAID. He has worked also in the private sector as an executive for Prisma Health, the largest private sector employer in South Carolina, where he led evidence-based efforts to promote health innovation and worked to create access and equity in healthcare, housing, and education. John has also served on the faculty at Furman University, Charleston School of Law, and served as, as a senior lecturer at Duke University School of Law. John is, is an amazing leader who has spent his career working to create access and opportunity. And I'd like to welcome him, John, if you join me to uh, the, the, the webinar. And I'd like for our viewers you know, to settle in for what I know will be an exceptional conversation. John, it's terrific to have you here at It Started at Horizons. Thank you, Michael. I, I feel like I'm a part of the Bearded Brothers Story Hour now that <laughs> my whole different contribution doesn't quite match yours, but it's good and to well, see you. you know, we, we have to keep that, keep that real, so we'll get that uh, Brothers Bearded uh, story, <laughs> story time going. Uh, so it's uh, terrific to see you. Um, let, me, let me give uh, folks a quick run of show, John, so they know what we're going to do here. So. First, I'd like to start, I'm going to ask you a, a couple of questions and, and we'll set some context for you and MDC and then I'm going to invite you to share some remarks about the work that MDC has embarked on that has implications for our topic today, racial equity. And then after your remarks, I will, um, I'll join you uh, for some, some Q&A and we will hear from the, um, the viewers on some questions that, that they might have. Um, but first, John, I want to say a little bit about why I um, thought it'd be great to um, have you with us today. So first, you know, um, you have a connection. You you have a connection to the South. You are you're from South Carolina, and I I I think that the South is so important. There's so many lessons for us at this time, and I just I'd just be curious um, if you would share a little bit about um, 
how it, does where you're from um, kind of impact the way that you think about your work today and uh, and equity? Thank you, Michael. And I'd also like to say thank you to JFF, which has long been a champion and partner in our work across the South, and, and we are grateful for that and, and look forward to continuing that, that, that deep and abiding friendship. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, as, uh, as someone who grew up in the South, relationships matter. I come from a family of teachers, preachers, and healers, and uh, if you'll Give me a minute, maybe a Baptist minute, not an AME minute. Uh, I can focus on the preacher's part. I, I grew up in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church, which is the second largest black denomination in the country. And, and it has its largest population in South Carolina, even though the first AME Church is in Philadelphia. I mention that because uh, it is it is part of uh, a moment that I think will resonate with a lot of people uh, on this uh, call, and that is uh, the, the church home away from home for my family uh, has always been Mother Emanuel. It's in Charleston, yeah. South Carolina. And I say it's our home away from home because I lived in, grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. But the, the pastor there, Clemente Pinckney, was someone with whom I'd grown up and grown up around in the AME circles. There's a young people's division. Clem was always the person who would win the speech contests that I would come in second or third. And so I, I got to know him by his oratorical skills uh, very early and uh, developed a, a genuine respect and love for him as he became a public servant. Uh, and. Uh, in addition to that, one of the other individuals who was uh, murdered uh, as part of the Emanuel Nine was a, a gentleman named Daniel Simmons. Uh, right. Daniel Simmons uh, is a distant, was a distant relative of mine, went to school with my mother. She knew him well. And so all of that is to say that that event didn't just hit close to home, it hit home. And it is emblematic of the Southern notion of place. Francis Mays, who's a North Carolina resident, says, where you are is who you are. And that's where I've been. Uh, it is where I've been rooted. It is uh, a place that means a great deal to me. And uh, it is also a place that is uh, not without its challenges. And we can get into that a little bit more. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, you know, I was thinking about kind of MDC. Um, many of us are focused on, you know, racial equity. Now we often cite, you know, kind of the murder of George Floyd, but, you know, MDC has been working on racial equity for the past, you know, 50 years. And I'd love it if you could share with us a little bit about that history, you know, what was MDC trying to do and, you know, what are the implications um, for today? And you've already touched on some of that, but would love to just have you give us some more context for MDC. M MDC is a product of a time when the South was creatively looking to solve problems. Uh, and sometimes bringing in national partners. The Ford Foundation is a part of our origin story. Uh, we were originally devoted to workforce development. Uh, and in the process of engaging in that work, we tried to bring together to see common cause uh, poor white communities, especially in rural areas of North Carolina and black communities. And uh, that at the time was considered to be dangerous. And I might suggest that it, it still could be considered dangerous today. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are now pursuing uh, a three-pronged strategy to achieve what we call growth for impact. Uh, the first is by uh, focusing on what I describe as equity-centered leadership, and that is really putting people and the dignity of people and opportunity for individuals at the heart of decision-making. It means that any, anyone can be a leader who's willing to learn and that leaders essentially are learners. And so I think that also animates this larger conversation about education as we're deeply interested in learners. Um, and, and we are engaged in that, not only through our leadership programs, but through designing systems for change. So systems designed for systems change is core to the work that we do, as well as the third prong, which is the demographic analysis. The State of the South report, which we'll release uh, early next year, will look at the four uh, challenges that currently confront us, climate change, COVID, 
what I call a, a racial intervention because I believe it's a response to addiction as opposed to a reckoning. And then the economic consequences of all three of those. And uh, we are looking to address that not only through data and demographic analysis, but by creating a narrative, a meaningful narrative that makes sense of what we see and what we're experiencing right now. Thank you, John. You know, one of the um, things I think about, um, there must be so many lessons, you know, MDC has as you worked across the South, not just on the kind of, uh, you know, kind of race neutral strategies, but taking race on as a central component of, um, you know, kind of conversation and interrogation. I think that in so many of our conversations today, we use the euphemisms of, you know, people of color and we don't hit, um, you know, kind of the issues head on. So um, I think that MDC's leadership there is, is um, to be commended. I remember back in 2004, um, the early days of the Achieving the Dream initiative where the, the previous CEO, David Dodson, um, from MDC tried to lead the, the partners in a conversation about structural inequity uh, back then, you know, naming many of the things that we're dealing with now. And, um, you know, so I just, you know, commend MDC uh, on, on your leadership and you, you've been there, you've been working. And so we, I think that we have a lot to learn from you and we'll, um, we'll, we're going to give you a, an opportunity to share some of your priorities in a, in a second. But one of the things I wanted to ask you before we invite you to, sh to share um, some of your thinking and priorities. You know, many people don't fully grasp that for many leaders of color, the professional is the personal. You, you, know, you just talked about uh, Mother Emmanuel, right, as a, as a powerful example of that. But your dad, you know, um, um, and I don't know about you, but, you know, I was really dismayed when I saw data from Raj Chetty on intergenerational mobility that showed that, you know, despite the fact that I might have the same education, income, wealth um, as my neighbors, that my son will earn less than his white peers in our neighborhood, you know, as an adult in 99%, you know, the census tracts in this country. I'm just curious about your thoughts about like that, that is structural, right? Like I have all the other, you have all the other, um, you know, kind of uh, elements, but yet, you know, I've also seen Brookings data that suggests that black middle class children are actually downwardly mobile. So the challenge, you know, is structural. And I'm just curious if you would just say a word on, you know, um, how you have hope <laughs> in the face of um, such structural um, challenge. Sure. Um, and and it's, it's still personal to me. I, as I mentioned, coming from a family of teachers, preachers and healers, uh, there have been ebbs and flows and the economic fortunes of, of people in my family across generations. Uh, even though my great grandmother went to college, that did not set up my family for continued and untrammeled success uh, after that because uh, those opportunities weren't uniformly available uh, for, for everyone in my family. And, and the other piece of it is that the, the consequences of failure uh, in an inequitable system uh, can be uh, really extreme. So there are no second chances, there are no third chances. It's not a, a, a moment when you can just take a year off and, and try to find yourself and, and then hope that you can right the ship. So as I think about what country and what world my son will inherit, and, and one of the things I admire about you uh, in, in all the ways that you're exceptional, you're, you're even more than exceptional, you're, you're you're ex exceptional, I'd say, uh, in, in, in ways that are uh, to be commended, is that you're a doting father too. And we want for our sons more than we have. Uh, all I can do is, is the best that I can do to put him in a, in a position to succeed. But I always have to be cognizant of the fact that there is no generational wealth. Uh, his inheritance uh, largely will be what he earns. And, uh, and, and in, in that context, it is uh, an early reality check. It's a different version of the talk that we yes. have to give our children, uh, yes. but it is yet uh, level setting and reality setting nonetheless. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, that means, it means so much. And you know, at JFF, our CEO, Maria Flynn, 
you know, really gave us a mandate to really engage the field and lift up voices of leaders who we need to hear from right now and the leaders of color. And so I'm so glad that you made time for us. And um, I do think it's really important right now in the national conversation where there's so much debate and discussion and frankly noise around what we're dealing with right now. You know, we talk about the the multiple pandemic, the two pandemics, the three pandemics, you know, and and we're talking about and in and around racism and we need a signal, you know, in all that noise. And, um, you know, it's my great honor to give you an opportunity. I would love to hear from you, given your vantage point, your experience working on access and equity throughout your career, but taking the helm of MDC as you lead that organization, what are some of the, you know, the priorities? What are some of your thoughts about, um, you know, what MDC is thinking about? How can you help us as a field um, kind of concentrate in on some priorities as we think about um, rectifying some of the things that are broken about um, race in this country? Um, I want to give you that opportunity now. I will go off camera and I'll join you um, for a little bit of Q&A after you share your remarks. Thank you, Michael. You got it. Uh, and I'll, I'll get specifically to uh, what MDC is engaged in shortly. Uh, we are uh, an organization that is uh, black led and black governed. Uh, our, our chair of our board of directors is, is an African-American man. Uh, we have a, a predominantly people a staff that's predominantly people of color. And uh, I feel that that helps us to uh, to speak with uh, a level of trust and authenticity uh, into the communities where we work and to also engage across uh, lines of difference in ways that I think are productive. But today we're, we're focusing on education and uh, the sub theme of this is, is past, present and future. And just to give you some context for, for the past, uh, not only as it's uh, applied to me, but as it's, uh, as it's, uh, been operative in the lives of many uh, in the United States. I was born in 1970 in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, and uh, the, the schools in, in my hometown of Lexington weren't fully integrated until 1974. Uh, that was a year before I started school formally. Uh, before that, uh, the, the school that operated for African Americans in my neighborhood was a Rosenwald school that had been created by Julius Rosenwald, a philanthropist who had funded schools for African-Americans across the, the country, but primarily in the South. And in some ways I'd consider them almost to be like an early version of charter schools. Uh, communities would put up money uh, to fund part of the construction and, and staffing of those schools and Rosenwald would, would provide the rest. And in my case, I grew up across the street from a Rosenwald school and uh, my mother still lives across the street from that school. And for me, it, it served as, as a focal point for not only my childhood, my family, my community, uh, but also what I saw in terms of uh, what is possible uh, within the black community. And growing up in South Carolina, I was also uh, proximate to the, the events that gave rise to Brown versus Board of Education a distant relative of mine, Majeska Simpkins, would host uh, Thurgood Marshall when he would come to South Carolina pursuing a case uh, that became known as Briggs versus Elliott. Briggs versus Elliott actually grew into Brown versus Board of Education. It was, it was one of many cases that were combined into what became Brown versus Board of Education. Our past in education was uh, training for uh, a certain place in society, training for certain conditions. And when that uh, was, was denied to some, then it also limited opportunities. And as we look uh, more closely at the present, especially right now, uh, where we're dealing with what is becoming known as a COVID generation, uh, a generation of kids who are being deeply impacted by the pandemic. And, uh, and for those who are marginalized, those impacts are gonna be even greater. Uh, we see a lack of broadband access, uh, which leads to poor in-home instruction. Uh, in one district in South Carolina in the spring semester, 30% of the students in that district 
simply disappeared after the school went to a virtual medium because they didn't have reliable internet access from home or their home conditions otherwise prevented them from being regularly in attendance for their lessons online. Uh, this also means decreased telehealth access at a time when telehealth is actually expanding. If you don't have access to uh, reliable, adequate broadband, then you don't really have access to a doctor. You don't really have access to medical care. And this in the time of and during the moment of a pandemic. So uh, the lack of broadband access uh, in, in poor communities and in rural areas in particular uh, has been deeply felt. Uh, and the lack of, of in-person instruction has also meant decreased nutritional access. It means that uh, kids who depend on school feeding programs uh, will, uh, will go hungry uh, because if, if, those, if those programs can't figure out other ways to address the, the, the need within their community, uh, then those kids suffer even tremendously. And, and that also has, a, has an impact on their ability to learn and to learn effectively in a school setting. We've seen that 28 million Americans have canceled their enrollment plans for this fall for college. Uh, that's a 20% decrease overall. And then when we look at high school seniors, those uh, applying for financial aid have dropped. And all of this is in the context of uh, a, an economy in which almost all of the jobs, 11.5 million out of 11.6 million jobs that were created after the Great Recession require at least some post-secondary training. What we also see in this moment is a loss of connection. Uh, the hyper-individualism that's pervasive in our society has, has decreased the other feeling. Uh, the, the, the controversies that exist around mask wearing and the, the advantages, uh, the communal benefits of, of things like mask wearing have, have really cast into doubt uh, what the notion of the commons is in an American context in this moment. Uh, we contest facts. We have a lingering question of whether we collectively share a North Star. What is or what are the organizing principles that unite us as a country, as a society? Uh, and all of this in the persistence of what I describe as an addiction to race. And I really do think it's an addiction. And, and what we're seeing at the moment is an attempt at an intervention. It's not the first attempt that we've had, and it, it may not be the last. Uh, and we know that racism costs us. Uh, the City Global Perspectives and Solutions Report show that racism has cost us $16 trillion in GDP since 2000. And if we wanted to take a more conservative approach, we could look at uh, the McKinsey estimate from uh, just before the, the City Report came out. And that put the, the forward-looking loss to the economy at $1.5 trillion between 2019 and 2028. At any rate, uh, what we do know is that racism is uh, crippling the economy in ways that we can't fully uh, grasp and understand because we haven't seen an economy that functions without it. We also know, as uh, the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard and others have observed, that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, it, it results in uh, uh, numerous instances of, of childhood trauma, uh, of, of adult mental health issues and anxiety, and things that often go untreated, especially in communities of color where uh, psychological care may be uh, deeply stigmatized. In the learning environment itself, uh, we've seen that learning days are, are, are lost uh, through school discipline. And uh, when there is school, black students are, are typically losing 103 days per 100 students in a school setting due to discipline issues. In contrast, white students lose 21 days per 100 students. In North Carolina, where I live currently, uh, Native American students lost 102 more days than white students uh, due to disciplinary activity. So in the current context, the way in which we organize the school environment, the, the way in which uh, students are viewed as learners uh, has deeply affected their ability 
to, to take advantage of the opportunities that certainly are greater than they have been in the past, but they may not be, uh, they may remain deeply inaccessible. And then the last thing that we, we see currently is, is beyond the school context. And, and it's, it's this, this notion of debt uh, and, and debt that can be crippling because for adults, it can affect their ability to be uh, uh, effective and uh, responsive parents for their children. And for children, it can create the kind of uncertainty and anxiety that can make the day-to-day -day life of, of, a, of a school student uh, very difficult because there's so many other things that one has to worry about. 40% of Americans had trouble paying for food, medical care, housing, or utilities in the last year. 70% of low and middle income households surveyed by the Center for Responsible Lending reported relying on credit cards for basic living expenses, medical expenses, or car and house repairs. The personal savings rate of the average American household is below 10%. And that's even when you account for the personal savings of wealthier families. Nearly half of Americans have no retirement savings, and more than 60% do not have $500 of cash on hand for emergencies. The average incomes of the top 5% of the households grew by 13.2% in 2018. In comparison, the average income in the bottom fifth fell by 3.2% during the same time period. This is indicative of what uh, the radio program Marketplace has defined as the K-shaped economy. Those who are doing well before the pandemic continue to do well. Those who are doing poorly uh, before the pandemic are now doing worse. And as Jay Powell the chair of the Federal Reserve uh, mentioned uh, some time ago, the worst uh, element of this pandemic after the loss of human life, and we're, we're now approaching a quarter of a million lives lost in the United States. And if just for context, 13,000 lives have been lost internationally due to Ebola uh, since Ebola first became an issue uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Powell observed that uh, other than the loss of life, the, the real tragedy is that people who were digging out of uh, their economic hole from the Great Recession are now being plunged right back into debt as a result of the pandemic. And for students, uh, the, the, the outlook is, is equally bleak. Uh, student loan debt comprises the largest percentage of non-mortgage debt held by Southerners. And this is likely because of the rising cost of education the unrestricted loan borrowing and low returns to credentials in the labor market. Southern states account for nine of the 10 states most burdened by credit card debt and penalties associated with this type of debt. In many Southern states, the burden is so high that families making a median household income would need more than 18 months to pay off the balance in some states. And auto loan debt, another form of consumer debt in Southern states increased by more than 50% between 2003 and 2017. Families take on loans with longer repayment terms, sometimes more than six years, and end up owing more on their vehicles than they're actually worth. So as we think of what comes next, uh, what the future holds, it's uh, a, a period of great uncertainty and anxiety, but I'd also suggest that it's a time for healing. And uh, that means that it's a time for learning, certainly, but a time for learning differently. And it's time for investment. And, 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 and as we invest, we can discover and recover the purposes of education. Uh, that is to train critical thinkers, uh, to create an educated citizenry, to, to make sure that people are ready for work that is meaningful, and to develop with them a capacity for thriving. MDC's role in this is to, to create what I call the thriving South. That is a South where potential energy becomes kinetic and we unlock the talent and humanity that's in our midst. We need not be resigned to the falsity that Frederick Douglass described. He said America was false to its past, false to its present, and binds itself to be false to its future. Uh, that certainly resonates as we look at the history of the country but it doesn't need to be our future. And we have an ability to change that. We're digging in uh, in the work that we're doing at, MD at MDC around uh, activities that span from K all the way through career, activities that are rooted in place, 
a program called Great Expectations in Forsyth County in, in North Carolina. It ensures that kids enter kindergarten ready to succeed. The KP Reynolds Trust has been a, a, a steady partner in, in guiding that work along with us. We've also worked with the Oak Foundation uh, in a program called Lens and C, in which we look at the intersection of race, equity, and learning differences uh, among a population that is often neglected or doesn't receive the same level of, of services uh, as, as wealthier students and wealthier parents and communities might have available to them. And then we're involved in, in talent development work and economic mobility work. We partnered with the Woodruff Hines Education Foundation in Mississippi to develop statewide post-secondary attainment goals. And we're constantly working on strengthening college community capacity. And all of this is to uh, work into in the service of, of a South that is thriving. We can be true to our past in all of its pain. We can be true to our present in building meaningful community and discovering all of those lost Einsteins that Raj Chetty refers to. And we can be true to our future by achieving the heretofore unrecognized clarity that comes with sobriety. If we could kick this addiction and we do it now, not tomorrow, not next year or when the time is right. In my work, that means three things. We lead through equity and the recognition of the basic dignity of all. There's dignity in work. Therefore, all who labor should be compensated with a wage that allows them to provide for themselves and their loved ones. Second, we design or redesign systems for equitable outcomes. Sometimes systems design requires systems change and to expect a different outcome from the same approach, there lies madness. It is the very definition of madness. Third, we ground all our actions in rigorous data and demographic analysis and create compelling narratives to make the numbers come alive. These three features are essential for meaningful, durable change in organizations and communities. Where does education fit in all this? The short answer is everywhere. Public education, education in general, is a bedrock public good. The economic mobility that Raj Chetty envisions, and which MDC does as well for that matter, is impossible without comprehensive educational opportunities. Uh, the, the engagement and support in our public education system fuels economic opportunity, but an education is about more than workforce training. A good education equips one with the tools to be a discerning consumer of information, to develop healthy habits of citizenship, and to be concerned for others in a way that is supportive and not simply pity or charity. It is only through education that we can be truly redeemed, and I know this to be true to the core of my being. I'm a product of a system, a public education system in South Carolina that was undergoing an immense amount of change in the 1970s and 80s. And as a part of the first truly integrated schools in Lexington, South Carolina, my parents taught in schools that were not allowed, that they were not allowed to attend. And I had the benefit of a tremendous gifted and talented program and later summer programs where I could stretch and put my talents to the test. And right now in my home state of South Carolina, kids are engaging in project-based learning in places like Colleton County or building houses and a technology center in my home district in Lexington County. They're being granted opportunity. There are amazing things happening in, in education around the South. We just need more. We need to be greedy about our collective success because it benefits us all. We need to be consumed by our collective success, even addicted, and that is an addiction to be enabled. W.B. Du Bois once said that as the South goes, so goes the nation. This generational moment is ours to invest, to build, to make real a thriving South and by extension a thriving nation. And so I'm deeply grateful for all of you who are engaging in that work, and I look forward to engaging further in the conversation around how we can make this uh, a reality for more people in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I really appreciate um, those, um, those comments. Um, very, very, very timely. Uh, as you were talking, um, there, there's so many things <laughs> that came to my mind. One of the questions I want to start with, and, and we're going to uh, also go to some questions 
from our viewers, but one of the, the things that I wanted to just touch base on is you mentioned that education, um, you know, education is key to this. And you also talked about um, the number of Americans who are, you know, essentially in debt. And we know that the cost of education, you know, continues to, to rise. And how, so how do we grapple with the reality that, you know, people need education and training, and at the same time, they're in financial condition where, you know, that is um, kind of, um, you know, it's like, almost like a vicious cycle. I'd just be curious about your thoughts about that. How do we, how do we begin to attack that? Certainly. Uh, uh, Michael, I, I think about this in, in some ways as uh, a constitutional comparativist and in looking at other places and other places around the world where there are investments in education, where there are public investments in education, uh, as opposed to looking at education as an entitlement, uh, I, I think the, 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 the appropriate lens through which we could view it is, is as an investment. It's an investment in, in our population. It's an investment in succeeding generations. And uh, we, we get a return on that investment. Uh, as, as I talked about the lost productivity that we realize in our economy uh, as a result of racism, uh, thinking about even if we got a fraction of that $16 trillion that we haven't realized in the last 20 years, uh, if we invested uh, a fraction of that even to achieve that uh, increase, uh, that is where we need to begin and reshape the conversation. When I worked in, in the, the Office of Management and Budget, we, we never had conversations about the size of government. We never mm -hmm. had conversations about how much money we needed to spend. We had conversations about how could we spend the money that we had effectively. And, uh, and I think if, if we approach uh, the, the, the challenges that confront us with respect to education in the same way uh, and see it as an investment as opposed to an entitlement, uh, we'd have different outcomes. Absolutely. Well, John, I don't want to do um, to you what people sometimes do to me and, and you, know, uh, you know, ask you questions and expect the actual answer like, to solving <laughs> racial inequality, but I'm very curious about your thinking, right? So, you know, I, I also, and JFF, we also think that education and training is one of the most powerful levers that we have, right. you know, to advance uh, people in the economy and to advance equity. At the same time, we see evidence that people of color, black people who earn credentials, you know, earn less than people, um, their, their white peers, right, for the same degree, and that happens at all levels of degrees. And so how does MDC, how are you thinking about uh, that reality and the structural nature of that? Like, how do we begin to um, attack that part of it? Education gets us part there, but not all the way there. I'd just be curious about your thoughts there. Uh, a, a couple of ways, and, and, and I'll, these are ways that we're thinking about it within our own organization. So we take our own medicine. Uh, and, and one of the things that we want to do is to ensure that internally we, we uh, embrace those values of equity as well. So we look within uh, pay bands within our organization to ensure that, that there, is, there is equity within people who have the same job descriptions and job titles, that there isn't a, a huge disparity. And that, that, that disparity certainly wouldn't be a result of someone's pedigree. Uh, so as, as we're looking at bringing people into the organization, we're being much more intentional now and in thinking about what are the, the, the skills and gifts that that person would bring to a role beyond what, what name is on their resume. Now, this is obviously, you know, for someone who went to Harvard and Duke, a statement against self-interest, but I'm, I'm happy to be a traitor to my class in this regard because I grew up with so many people who were uh, talented, skilled, just as skilled and talented as, as, as I am. And I, I labor under no delusion that there's, there's much of a difference, but there is luck involved in that. And, and, and when you have no second chances, if you make a mistake, uh, then uh, the consequences of that can be critical. So we wanna take all of that into, into account when we're thinking about who we're bringing into our organization. And then as we're working with communities to, to, to share that experience, to say, 
you have preferences, but you also have requirements. And it's, it's, it's most important to focus on the requirements as opposed to the preferences. And, and I think that's a way to, to start addressing some of the inequity that exists uh, uh, despite similarities in education and training. You know, John, as you were talking, you know, one of the one of the uh, questions I had in my mind, you know, was about kind of the skills versus credentials, because you interestingly for, for me, as you were talking about education, you actually mentioned critical thinking right at a time in the national discourse where a lot of the conversation around education is on, you know, occupations and, you know, and, you know, specific skills. Um, and so as you think about kind of credentials, you know, um, you know, like you said, you went to Harvard and Duke, right? Like, as you think about credentials versus skills, on the one hand, I think that you are saying like, hey, pedigree shouldn't be everything, but, you know, how are you thinking about, how do we help people parse, <laughs> you know, skills versus credential? If you're a person of color, um, you know, how do you navigate? Again, trying to get at that signal, how, how are you thinking about that? Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, frequently about it um, and, and uh, as, as, as I consider how we, we, we navigate that, that space, uh, also just trying to, to get people to move beyond what is the easiest thing to do and, and what is the thing to do that's based on familiarity. People hire based on pedigree or, or based on uh, your your educational background because it's shorthand and they think that it's a way to avoid making mistakes. Uh, and if, if we can engage more deeply with folks as they're in the process of, of, of applying for jobs, to so think about what are the skills that you have and, and how can we pull those out in an interview process that's more than just a, a, a rote set of questions that are really meant to elicit whether or not someone fits into a box. Uh, is this person creative and how does that creativity manifest itself? Uh, would they have the supports in place to allow them to, to do their work in ways that are going to, to be uh, valuable to them and, and meaningful for the organization? And then the last piece of this in terms of culture uh, is being comfortable with not looking for the perfect hire but looking for someone who can grow into a job, uh, given the right supports, given the right uh, mentorship, and given the right environment. One of the other things that I've seen in my own uh, professional life and in and, and, and the experiences of some of my friends is that if we're the first to enter into a profession or into an organization, it's difficult to understand how you create a career path for yourself. It's difficult to understand how to be, period. And so we then relied upon each other largely to ask the questions that were necessary to understand where we were. And uh, I think of how I can create that in the context of an organization that I'm, I'm a part of, but also with the communities with whom we work in. Absolutely. So we're going to go to some questions from the audience, um, John, in a second. But I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned supports. And in the field, uh, we talk about education and workforce development. You know, we talk about supports a lot. We talk about wraparound supports. And I'm just curious, you know, we live in a society that in some ways is, you know, awakened to racial inequity, but at the same time um, appears to be very against kind of affirmative methods to address inequity. And so when we're thinking about supports and people might need different types of supports, it kind of, there's kind of a disconnect there. And so, you know, and, and, and you mentioned earlier the disinvestment, right? And so how do we get at, you know, kind of that disconnect, you know, the, the supports we know are needed because of the inequity, but yet so many Americans um, are not, supportive of kind of um, affirmative, like let's say affirmative action, but even affirmative methods. I'd be just curious if there are any thoughts or lessons from your work in the South or MDC's work around how we begin to deal with that. Sure. A couple of things. One, they're not microwave solutions, so it will take time. Sure. Uh, two, uh, in taking time, the activities that you're going to design to try to address those problems will have to be different. Uh, so to the point earlier about not trying to do the same thing, expecting a different outcome. Uh, 
Uh, and as, as we look at the persistent problems of race and, and how they manifest themselves across society, it, it screams for a different approach. It screams for something new. And then thirdly, uh, it goes all the way back to Aristotle. Treat likes alike and unlikes unalike. And there is a, the briefest definition of equity that I could, I could imagine, that you treat likes alike and unlikes unalike. If people are not alike, then how, then it, then differential treatment is justified. It may even be necessary. Yeah, yeah. So we have a, a question from, um, that, that is kind of apropos of what we're talking about, and it's about um, political positions. So how important are political positions um, in, help, in, in, in helping to give aid to um, people who are underprivileged? And we've got political change happening in the country right now, also political division, but you know, what are your thoughts about uh, political, um, the role of the political positions in helping create some of the aid and support? I, I think that there, there's greater opportunity for uh, engaging with people um, outside of their political positions, uh, but looking at their, their, their circumstances in life and, and building opportunities for, for shared commonalities. Uh, in working with, with, with various groups, I found that going back to origin stories and having people talk about where they're from, uh, what they're about, who they are beyond their title, beyond their last name, uh, beyond uh, the, the place where they were educated. That creates a level of connection that then allows people to engage outside of the heat of politics. In many ways, I think politics is a distraction right mm. now. Uh, and it's, it's designed to be so by, by those who are benefiting from it. And so while you obviously have to acknowledge political reality, I am a political animal, I lived in that world. Uh, I also think that one of the most powerful things you can do in a highly politicized environment is ignore politics uh, because they, they demand attention, they crave attention. Uh, but if you can do your work, if you can engage in the work in the same way that MDC began uh, in, in 1967 uh, without um, being overtly political, uh, then I think there's value in that. When I talk about equity, uh, I say to my friends who are libertarians that you can't be a libertarian and not be uh, supportive of equity because you need equity as a precondition for liberty. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm forgetting, but I know you'll remember. So the, who, the philosopher, is it Jonathan Haidt or, that wrote, wrote about the um, talking to the, you know, uh, people's elephant versus the writer. <laughs> right, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, so I'm just curious, so like, are you suggesting that um, in a time of political polarization, one way that we get at, and I'm kind of riffing off a question here, get at expanding investment at a time where half the country, you know, is in a different place around who deserves investment and who deserves opportunity, are you suggesting that we need to engage kind of in conversation with maybe the other side around kind of origin stories. And I'm, I'm just, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but like help me understand um, how we bridge that divide and get people on the same page around kind of the investment you're saying that that's needed. It's going to, and it's going to require building a critical mass because the, the messages that people receive in other places are, are always going to contradict something that's, that's intended to steer them away from the noise of politics. Uh, and and I don't I don't at all pretend that it's easy, or that this is this is a solution that we can just glide into and glide through, uh, especially at a time when I once thought that you could appeal to the human impulse not to see someone else suffer to convince someone to do something that would be in in the common interest. And when I worked for a healthcare company, I thought that we could advance health equity by appealing to the sense that no one wants to see someone lose a leg because they're diabetic. So if you can engage in activities that are going to help that person tip out of di a diabetic state or, or have access to insulin on a regular basis, you would do so. But in, in the current context and given what we're seeing with, with uh, respect to the response to the pandemic, I don't know if that's true anymore. And, and, and that is in some ways a function of what people are hearing, what messages they're hearing. Unless we can build a critical mass of people who are saying that's enough, like 
we have to move in a different direction, uh, then those messages will continue to predominate. And they're very powerful. They're, they're very sophisticated and they're very seductive. So that's, therein lies the tension, Michael. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have a question here around um, kind of how do we help people um, essentially navigate kind of artificial intelligence and um, can you, the future of work, um, bot facilitated interviews. So how does all of this impact kind of equity and the populations that we're trying to serve? Uh, I, I think this is also where ethics becomes a, 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 a it, it's enlisted in the service of equity. Uh, and uh, we, we don't talk a lot about ethics as we're, we're discussing uh, uh, issues of equity, but I, I, in, in this particular context, I think it's, it's really appropriate because what you've described are tools. Uh, and and a, a tool can be used in any number of ways, but uh, with respect to technology, uh, we can uh, allow technology to become more than a tool and to become so all-consuming that it it is it's it has outsized uh, uh, influence on us, and whether it's in an educational context or uh, or social context, uh, over reliance on a particular tool is is going to yield uh, disparate outcomes. And so, as as we're thinking about education in an AI age, uh, how we in how we deal with uh, the leveraging of, of technological tools to enhance our ability to reach a broader audience, to reach students where they are and in different ways and in individualized ways. Uh, we also have to create for ourselves some ethical guidelines as to how we're going to use this. Uh, the, the, the equity issue is not going to be solved if we're going to say you can do whatever you want to do. And, and if you have a, a model that is going to be uh, economically successful, uh, that you can you can pursue that to its its end without any concern as to what effect it's having on the people who are using that product. Yeah, yeah. I just kind of sticking with this um, this in this vein. Um, there's a lot of energy right now on kind of tech and digital skills and you know coding boot camps and almost as if it's like a strategy for for equity, right? Like how do we uh, get you know, kind of people of color, digital skills, they don't have digital skills, they don't have broadband. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'll get, show my hand on on some level, I perceive that to be um, a diversion, right? Because if we are hiring based on, you know, um, credentials and there are screens, right? Like, I'm not sure we know what skills people actually have if we have, you know, false screens. So. I'd just be curious, you know, um, can we solve this problem through getting people, you know, digital skills and getting them through boot, coding boot camps and employing them, you know, kind of in technology pathways seems to be um, one of the solutions that put that's put forward quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, the short answer is no, we can't. Um, but it is one of the solutions that we can employ. And where so, I've seen it done best, uh, I, I've, I've seen some organizations where the, the screening for people who are coming into these opportunities for you know, coding uh, training, uh, coding training programs and that kind of thing, are, um, are are neutral to who's on the other side of the computer screen. So as they're screening for for skills, they have no idea if the person who's who's a potential applicant is seventy years old or seventeen years old. Uh, they don't know if it's if it's a, a person of color uh, or a white person or a man or a woman. All they know is what that that individual is able to demonstrate in in the screening mechanism. Once that person is deemed to be qualified, uh, then they're they're brought into the program without charge, and I think that's very important mm. uh, because the program is linked to uh, to an employer, and the employer is actually using that program as a way to uh, identify and develop talent. And so people get an opportunity to train, go through an apprenticeship program, move into employment with that company, and they never pay a dime because what they're really being, what's really happening is they're being hired and then they're being trained. 
And on the very front end of that, they're being hired with no regard to who they are, what, where they went to school. None of yeah. those questions are asked. And, and in looking for people who can be coders, the skills that a coder, uh, that make for a good coder, uh, aren't skills that, that, that show up on a resume. And so in that way, I think there's something to be learned. Uh, but it's not going to be the, the overall solution to this issue. Sure. John, thank you so much. We're kind of it, kind of getting to the end of our time. You have about five minutes left, and I have um, just a couple of uh, things I think will be helpful for the audience. So you talked, um, you talked about uh, debt, and you've got some work that's going to be available soon on that. Like if you could share that, there's some people that I think that there's some comments about wanting some of the statistics, you know, that you shared. So people will have that, right? Because you're about to release some reports. If you would, um, would you share um, briefly about um, what's forthcoming with the uh, reports on debt that you talked about? And then also, do you have a, another State of the South report coming out also? We do. We do. Okay, so it'd be great if we could learn about those two resources. Sure. Um, as we wrap up? Sure. So first, uh, we will be releasing uh, three reports on on the, the effects of debt in the South uh, in a program that's been funded by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. That'll be next week, and uh, they'll come out at the end of next week. And, and some of the, 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 statistics, the statistics that I was giving you on, on debt in particular come from those reports, so you'll see more of that information there. And what we do is we, we look at the problem, we, we highlight the problem, and then we propose some solutions to uh, how we address this. And I see that as, as part of uh, a, a broad issue of debt that is confronting us now and, and into the foreseeable future. In addition to that, uh, uh, late into the end of first quarter of, of 2021, second quarter of 2021, uh, we'll be releasing the next version of State of the South. Uh, that report will speak to those uh, four challenges that I, I laid out earlier, and um, and we'll have some convenings around that. So, State of the South will become more of a more than a, a report uh, from MDC. It will be a, a lever for convening solutions oriented conversations around some of these issues. Well, it's great, John. We want to keep in touch with you on that. I'd love to collaborate with you on that. Um, there's so much, I think, terrific work that. That we can do together. We have so much um, kind of uh, over overlapping yeah. Yeah. Uh, goals. Um, so I want to um, first just thank you for this conversation. Um, we will make this uh, video available, um, I believe, after um, this conversation. I think it'll be available for folks. Right. So, that's terrific. so I will um, uh, give you one final question that's from a, um, one of our viewers um, sure. that I think is a good one to end on. And it's really kind of what's giving you hope right now? Like what's giving you hope, um, education and the work that you're doing? What's, what's giving you hope right now? Uh, the success has always given me hope. Uh, I, I taught in South Africa during the, the transition from apartheid uh, in 93 and 94. And 95, and there was a student I kicked off of my basketball team there uh, just because he wasn't doing the work. <laughs> and um, I got a I got a message from him on on Facebook uh, a couple of years ago, decades later, thanking me for kicking him off the basketball team because he said that woke me up. Hmm. Uh, and he said, "I appreciate you doing that because it showed that you actually cared about me. You're paying attention." Uh, as a teacher that's what keeps you going and that's that's the kind of thing that gives me hope what gives me hope is that i know that we can make a difference in the communities where we work and we can identify some lost einsteins who would otherwise go completely undiscovered across yeah. the 13 states in which we operate that gives me hope what gives me hope is that if we're all committed if enough of us are committed we can truly truly turn this around so that our country is in a different place in 10 or 15 or 20 years. When our sons are older and adults, they can enjoy a place that looks different uh, than it currently does. That Absolutely. Always hope. Absolutely, let's let's work on that, John. I'd love to, yeah. love, to yeah. love to do that. Well, thank you so much, we're out of time. Wanna thank all of our viewers today for joining us at um, Started at Horizons and this video uh, will be available and um, be on the lookout for the release of the materials um, 
John, they can get that on your website, MDC website. Yes, they can. MDCINC.org. Okay. That's our last word. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. Thank you.